So after comparing the MIDI and the audio clips, again, one of the biggest features that marks the differences between them is the fact that we can warp audio clips. And I've mentioned the term warping a few times. Uh, I've already mentioned that it's Ableton speak for time stretching, but there's so much to warping and it's really important to get a grasp of this before we get too deep into creating content. Um, Warping is probably the strongest feature that Ableton Live has, at least the one that most people know about and one of the things that makes people gravitate towards this program. So understanding warping, at least on a basic level, sooner than later is really going to help you make progress and make Ableton Live a much less frustrating experience and a lot more fun to experiment with. With that said, what I'd like to do is revisit this clip, this drum break clip that I have on audio two, uh, on track two. We duplicated this clip a number of times uh, and we changed some of the clip properties. And on this last instance of the clip, what I did is I multiplied the tempo of this clip by two. Now again, this is the tempo that Ableton Live thinks is the original tempo of this particular clip. And it uses this information so that it can either play the clip faster or slower based on the tempo of the project. If the original tempo of this clip is 260 something BPM, it's gotta play it significantly slower so that it plays in sync with our master tempo of 126. Now, there's a lot more to warping than just that. I'm gonna go ahead and bring this clip back to its original tempo. So again, underneath the segment BPM, that's what that stands for. I'm gonna hit the button that is divide by two. This brings it back to 134, and this is the original tempo of this clip. I'm gonna go ahead and play this now. Okay. Now we've already established that uh, this is gonna play in sync with our master tempo because this clip has been warped. But what does that really mean? Well, let's look at the clip in a bit more detail. I'm gonna bring this up here. Now when we turn warp on, we've seen that a beat grid shows up. And if I zoom in a little bit, we can see there's sections of this clip. Uh, each beat is either a darker gray or a lighter gray color. The further in that I zoom, we can see there's more lines that are added. And if I look in the lower right hand corner, this is telling me that each line represents 128th note, which is a bit extreme. But the point is, is that we have this grid uh, that's lined up against our audio. This only shows up if warp is on. If I turn warp off, there's no beat grid there. Now the significance of the beat grid isn't just that Ableton Live will guess the tempo and put the audio correctly against the beat grid. This also allows you to stretch the audio in very unique ways. Now, before we get to that, let's look at what else shows up when we turn warp on. I turn warp off, the lines go away, the numbers up top go away, but there's also some other markers that I notice that I don't see anymore. So if I turn warp on, we zoom in here, we can see there's these little gray markers that show up. As I hover my mouse over them, we can see them show up. And you might notice that these Markers typically show up whenever there's a volume spike, whenever the volume suddenly jumps higher in our audio clip. These markers are called transient markers. And a transient is essentially a very quick attack uh, or a very quick volume spike, a uh, quick volume onset. So if we go from a part of the audio that's really quiet and then the volume suddenly jumps, that is a transient and a transient marker will be placed there. Ableton Live is able to use these transient markers to help detect the tempo of the track, okay? Now we can also use these transient markers in order to freely move the audio wherever we want and really start taking advantage of warping. So I'm gonna loop just one bar of this clip. Here's my loop button, I will turn loop on. My loop length right now is four bars. I'm gonna click in that first box, I'll type one and press enter and now I have a one bar loop. Let's play our one bar loop. And we'll zoom in here a bit. Now, in addition to these transient markers, there's also a big yellow marker that showed up at the beginning of our clip. Again, if I turn warp off, we don't see any markers up top. I turn this back on, we have one yellow marker along with our transient markers. This yellow marker is called a warp marker. And again, we're just getting into this, so I don't wanna to dive too deep just yet. I wanna give you a foundation so when we circle back around and revisit this, you'll understand the concepts uh, a lot more profoundly. Now, this warp marker, think of it as an anchor. When a warp marker is here, this position of the audio, the audio where this warp marker is, is essentially kind of locked in place, okay? And each warp marker determines the tempo. 
You could have more than one warp marker per file, which would mean that you would have tempo changes as the audio plays back. If there's only one warp marker, then you've established one tempo for the entire file. So this warp marker, when we click on this warp marker, the segment BPM, it says 134. If I click somewhere else up here, you see I'm clicking somewhere other than the warp marker. I'm clicking on these transient markers. There we go. And we see now the segment BPM is grayed out because these transient markers don't determine the tempo. The warp marker does. Now, if I knew that this file was a different tempo from 134, I could click on that one warp marker and simply type in a different tempo. Let's say I thought this was 100 BPM. If I type in 100 and press enter, you're gonna notice the audio suddenly lines up differently against the beat grid. 1.2 is the second beat of the first bar. 1.3 is the third beat of the first bar. 1.4 is the fourth beat of the first bar. If I turn my loop brace back on, this should just be a one bar loop, but I've changed the original tempo, what Ableton Live thinks is the original tempo of this clip, I've changed it to 100 BPM. If I play this with the metronome on, it's clearly not right. I could type in a different tempo, let's say 150, press enter. We see the audio moves against the beat grid again, and now it's playing too slowly. So let me bring this back to 134, which is the original tempo. As I play this, let's start looking at where the audio lines up against the beat grid. I'll turn the metronome back on really quickly. So one, two, three, four. On the second beat and the fourth beat, we have a snare. One, three, four, one, three, so often uh, when you're hearing music at its original tempo, there's typically gonna be a snare on the second beat and the fourth beat of the bar. This is not always, but this is pretty typical uh, unless you're listening to styles like you know dubstep and trap and things like that. But for most traditional music, your snare is gonna hit on the second beat and the fourth beat of the bar. So this brings us back to warping and some creative ways we can utilize warping. The most basic way to use it is to import some audio and make it so that it plays at whatever tempo our project is set to. But some creative ways to approach this is to make it so that the audio plays in a different rhythmic way than it's normally supposed to. So a quick example of this, and again, I won't dive too deep, but just give you something to play around with. I have a one bar loop. If I grab any of these transient markers that are placed after this yellow warp marker, I can grab this, click and hold, and then I can move this to the left or the right. And you see my audio is stretching. So the warp marker, that yellow marker, is acting like an anchor. The audio below that's not going to move. But I can stretch the audio that's happening after that. Okay, I'm just clicking and holding and dragging this around. So let me bring it back so it snaps to 1.2. When you're moving the transient markers, they'll snap to the grid as well. Okay. Now let's say maybe you don't want to stretch the entire audio file. Maybe you only want to stretch a certain part of this. Well, if I double click on any of these transient markers, or basically anywhere in this area up here, I can create another warp marker. Let me go right here and I'm gonna double click. And now I have another yellow warp marker. So if I grab that same snare and I move it, watch what happens. The front part of the audio file is being stretched longer, but everything from this snare to the second warp marker is basically being uh, shortened in terms of its duration. Okay, everything after that second warp marker is not being affected. So again, the warp markers act like an anchor. Okay, it's locking the audio that's in that position at a certain, uh, at that specific beat. So by placing warp markers strategically, we can totally rearrange the way that this drum break plays. Here's a quick example. I wanna make this snare hit an eighth note later. The next eighth note would be halfway between the second beat and the third beat, which is right here, 1.2.3. Now I don't want to affect the rest of the audio clip. So I'm gonna go ahead and put a warp marker here because I don't want this part of the audio to move. And I'm gonna put another warp marker here because this is what plays right after that snare and I only want to move the snare. So by placing these warp markers here, I've essentially made it so I can move this snare without moving anything before this and without moving anything after this. 
So I'm gonna grab my transient marker and move this snare that's at 1.2 to 1.2.3. So now we've changed the placement of this snare while preserving the timing of the rest of the clip. Let's take it a step further. I want to take this snare and I'm also going to move this to be an eighth note later at 1.4.3. But I don't want to affect the timing of this hit before it. So I'll place a warp marker there. That's going to lock this part of the audio in place. And I'm not worried about the timing of these two little hi-hats happening afterwards. So I don't need another warp marker. I'll grab my snare by hovering over the transient marker, click and hold, and slide this there. So just like that, we've totally transformed the rhythm of this audio clip. Now that's just one of many different ways that we can approach using warping uh, in a creative way to manipulate, to mangle, to change aspects of our audio. Uh, there's so much more we can do with this, but again, warping is a very broad concept and I don't want to overwhelm you guys too soon, uh, but this is definitely a fun way to start playing with your audio clips. And again, this is just another unique feature uh, that's available in audio clips that's not available in MIDI clips. So if you have some loops that you want to play around with, this is a great way to get familiar with how warping works. Uh, just remember, each warp marker, each yellow marker acts like an anchor. It's locking the audio underneath that warp marker in place. And then you can grab other parts of the audio clip and freely move them around. If you place a warp marker before and after uh, a part of the audio clip that you wanna manipulate, you can move that audio around without affecting anything that's placed before or after the warp marker there. So hopefully that makes sense after you've seen this demonstrated uh, and you play around with it a bit more, I think you'll be more familiar with the process. And to me, this is what really made the light bulb go off in my head and let me know that Ableton Live was the right doll for me. I love to manipulate audio, and this is extremely fun and very unique to this particular program.